way that he writes Jesus' birth story. So in general, here are some of the themes that illustrate Luke's purpose. One goal is about defending Christianity. Luke is obviously trying to defend the usefulness and legitimacy of Christianity. This is mainly in Acts that we see it, um, but it also comes out in Luke and also a little bit in some of these birth stories, as we'll find later tonight. Another major goal in Luke's writings is about God's purpose to bring salvation to all people, including the Gentiles. And we can see this build up later in the Gospel again, and especially in the book of Acts, but this again, we see a little bit of this in the birth stories. And finally, another major goal of Luke's is to show God, is to demonstrate how God and Jesus showed care towards those who were marginalised in society. And that's one of the main themes of Luke, and this is, this is probably of all the themes which I mentioned over here, it's probably the theme that comes out strongest in the birth stories tonight. So a bit more on that later. So it's just helpful to have us, for us to ha have a bit of an idea of the actual purpose and direction of the section of scripture um, that we're looking at. Um, however, tonight we're going to focus mainly on the story and the characters themselves. So let's first just go through a bit of a, a high-level overview. The story starts in Luke 1, verse 5 to 25, with the announcement of John the Baptist's birth. Here we're introduced to Zachariah, an old priest who finds the news too much to believe, as well as Elizabeth, uh, his wife, who is considered barren and past the age of childbearing. Then the story switches over to Mary in Luke 1, verse 26 to 28. Mary is a young virgin who hears that she is to be the mother of the Son of God. Then in 1, verses 39 to 56, the two mothers meet and Mary celebrates God's grace to the humble with a song called the Magnificat, My Soul Magnifies. And then, after giving us an announcement, giving, writing for us the announcement of the two miracle children, Luke moves on to the story of their births. So, starting with the birth of John, um, he talks about Elizabeth giving birth to John and Zachariah's um, beautiful song of praise called the Benedictus, which means, blessed be the Lord. Right after that, Luke narrates the story of the birth of Christ, and we read of how he was visited by shepherds, who had the news announced to them with an angelic song, and this song is called Gloria in Excelsis, Glory to God in the Highest. And then following that, Luke tells the story of Jesus cleansing in the temple, and that gives us a bit of a glimpse into the lives of some old people who are waiting for this time to come. There's an old man named Simeon who told, who were told that he wouldn't die until he sees Christ, and then he responds to this news with the last song in our section, called Nunc Dimittis, Now You Dismiss. And in the story, we also read of an old widowed prophetess who has lived most of her life in the temple and finally sees the Messiah. So based on that overview, you might notice that there's a bit of a structure to the story, or you might not, that's fine. And I'll just go through this kind of structure briefly because it can help us to appreciate the way that Luke laid out the story and to understand what's being written and to make it a bit more memorable. So the first thing is that there's basically three intertwined stories of promise and fulfilment. One, you can probably see from the table mainly, that firstly Zacharias promised that he and Elizabeth would bear a son. The evidence of that fulfilment is obviously that John is born. And the praise response is the song of Zachariah. Also you see that Mary's promised a son and the evidence um, the evidence of that is the way that the unborn John reacts to her arrival when she meets Elizabeth. And Mary's song of praise is the response to that. And then in another character we see in chapter 2, Simeon, who was promised that he'd see the Messiah, which is fulfilled when he sees the Messiah. And again, he responds with his song. So, as we read of these momentous events in the first two chapters of Luke, we can see a common formula to this news being announced and of, of belief being rewarded when those promises are fulfilled and the moving responses of these people that these promises would come true. The second thing we might notice is the stories of, of John and Jesus and, and that they're pretty much told in parallel as you'd be able to see on the table in the screen. Um, it goes through the introduction of the parents, the announcements, the response of the mothers. All those happen pretty much first with John, then with Jesus, 
Then it talks about the birth of John, then the birth of Jesus, and it's also about the circumcision and naming, the pro prophetic response, and then ends with like a single verse description on the growth of the child, how they grew in wisdom and favour and all that. Um, also, I won't go into this in a lot of detail, um, but you'll be, yep, you'll be able to see on some of the tables in the following slides that Luke seems to be drawing a lot on, on a lot, quite a few Old Testament themes, um, and I didn't get the time to write them all down into this PowerPoint, but there is a bit of a comparison, especially to the promises to Abraham and Sarah. Um, such as, you know, they were both barren, they were both old, they were both promised a child. Um, there was the, the concept of eternal promises that got, you know, referred from back, from Luke back to Genesis again. There's the old age and the question of how it's possible. Um, and also there's discussion about how nothing is impossible with God. There's the establishment of the circumcision. Um, so, if you're interested in those in detail, you can contact me and I'll be more than happy to send you the slides. So, that's the story in a nutshell. And basically, the point I'm making there is that what we will see is that there's... Luke's quite interested in making a lot of connection with the Old Testament. Um, and it seems like there's a lot of people who, when when Christ eventually is revealed to them, we see Israel in quite a bad state. Um, so in order to appreciate this more, you might like to read the two chapters in full in your own time, but you'd probably notice just how charged the story is with hope and excitement, because it's a dramatic shift from those centuries of relatively dark times to a sudden burst of hope. So ever since the Israelites were taken into exile, um, 600 years ago by that point, Israel had never been the same. They never had a king again, and Israel, as a result, was not a sovereign state, and there were many terrible wars and struggles for power that Israel was caught right in the middle of, and sometimes there were even direct attacks on their own religious convictions. So Israel, as, as the whole nation, had seemed to be in a really dark place for a long time, and it seemed like God could have been completely absent. And right now, Israel was ruled by an Edomite, or an Edomian, as they're now called. And over him, there's the Roman Empire, which is maintained by taxes and registration and censuses. So, think on that. And now consider the differences when suddenly angels start appearing to faithful people again, announcing miraculous births, including that of another king in Israel, whose kingdom will never end. And centuries, so, centuries after the exile, it finally seems like God will redeem his people again. And like Zechariah said in his song that we'll talk about later tonight, by the tender mercy of our God, the dawn from on high will break upon us to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet in the way of peace. So speaking of Zechariah, let's move on with the actual story that we're covering tonight, starting with the announcement of John's birth. So from Luke chapter 1 and from about verse 5, we're introduced to Zechariah and Elizabeth, and they're both basically described as righteous Jewish role models. That's the way Luke seems to introduce them. They're described as blameless in verse 6, following all God's commands and regulations. In verse 5, they have a good pedigree, with Zechariah being the priest of the priestly order of Abijah and Elizabeth being a descendant of Aaron himself. However, they had no heritage of their own, as Elizabeth was barren. So let's think about the subject of barrenness a little bit more. This was something that Elizabeth in particular felt ashamed of. Barrenness was seen as punishment by the people of the time, and the IVP Bible background commentary, um, to help us out, says that to be childless was economically and socially disastrous. Economically, because parents had no one to support them in old age, and socially, because in the law, barrenness was sometimes a judgment for sin. And many people just assumed the worst because of a problem. Sorry, they assumed the worst possible cause of a problem. And here's when it becomes particularly painful for Elizabeth. It's because most people assumed the barrenness of the wife and Jewish was, was her fault, basically. And a Jewish teachers generally insisted a man divorce a childless wife so that he could procreate and have that heritage 
that Zachariah and Elizabeth didn't actually have in the end. So it's against this background of economic and social struggle that we, we start seeing Zachariah on a very so, a special occasion on his life. He was chosen, he was a priest, and he was chosen by lot to offer incense in the temple. And that was something that historically only happened once in a person's life due to the overabundance of Levites at the time. But this special occasion didn't go very smoothly for him because right then an angel appeared to him and said that their prayers were going to be answered, that they're going to have a son who will not only bring rejoicing and gladness to the couple, but to many others as well, a child full of the Holy Spirit who will prepare a people for the Lord. Understandably, this is quite staggering news um, because, I'll just reiterate this, to our knowledge, God hadn't shown any noticeable intervention in Israel for centuries. And I wouldn't be surprised if Zechariah thought that the days of miracles and prophets and angels and barren women giving birth, he, I wouldn't be surprised if he thought that all of that just belonged to the past. And, God, and that God doesn't even seem to work like that anymore and that he no longer even works for Israel. Maybe even, even doubted that, this would have, that all that happened at all, we don't know. But we do know that Zechariah found this hard to believe. And in response to... In response to that announcement, there were three remarkable things that happened. Firstly, Gabriel made him mute until the day of John's birth. And with that being said, Zechariah's experiences what was probably the first sign that all of this is actually going to be true. Only he wasn't actually speaking, so he wouldn't actually be able to vocalise his acceptance of it. Um, secondly, an angel revealed himself as Gabriel, and once again, there's another strong connection to the New Testament, as Gabriel was one of the angels mentioned in the book of Daniel, and we can understand why well, this would be quite momentous. Imagine if Gabriel appeared to us after centuries of his absence. And thirdly, they would eventually find that Elizabeth has conceived, which is a pretty obvious sign that she is going to give birth. Elizabeth's reactions to this miracle um, actually recall some of the praise made by other barren women in the Old Testament, especially Genesis. So I've mentioned Sarah before, um, but there's some others as well. And she said in verse 25, this is what the Lord has done for me when he looked favorably upon me and took away the disgrace I have endured among my people. She saw this as a disgrace and it's similar, I guess, to, to the matriarch Rachel who said that God has removed my reproach. And you can probably see some other familiar themes as well in the example of Hannah in 1 Samuel um, chapter 2 and in Genesis 21, verse 6 to 7 as well. So at this point, the story moves over to Mary, six months later when Gabriel appeared to her. Mary was likely around her mid-teens and some have thought that she might have even been as young as 12, um, as that is the age when girls tended to be married in those times. As one who was both young and a woman, Mary would have a pretty low social status in those times. So when an angel appears to her and says, greetings, favoured one, the Lord is with you, we can understand why she was so perplexed, as verse 29 says. But despite Mary's initial confusion and her questioning of how she'd be able to become a virgin, the exchange we see here is just in general a lot calmer than what we saw with Zechariah. When Zechariah has this all revealed on a very special and public religious occasion in the capital of Israel, Mary has this revealed to her quietly in a relatively small town of Nazareth. And where Zechariah couldn't believe the news and was made dumb and again was a very public spectacle, Mary calmly accepted that this was to happen. And that's a remarkable thing because as we're just going to see now, there's, been, there's a lot of consequences for that action. And, and we'll talk, talk of some more examples later, but for now, let's just realise that there's, there's firstly a great responsibility to raise a son, who Gabriel here would describe as the son of the Most High, and one who would reign over an everlasting kingdom in verse 33. Not only was Mary to carry a child and to raise a child, but she was to do it all in preparation for a great and painful purpose, as we as we'll talk about later. And secondly, there's a threat to her marriage and to her honour. The Tyndale New, T New Testament commentary writes that she was not yet married to Joseph. His reaction to her pregnancy might have been expected to be a strong one, and 
Matthew tells us that he did in fact think of divorcing her. Again, while the death penalty for adultery does not seem to have been carried out often in those days, it was still there, and Mary could not be sure that she would not have to suffer and perhaps even die. But she recognised the will of God and accepted it. And also there's that, th that shame involved. So Joseph may have had it revealed to him by an angel that Mary was in fact a virgin who was faithful to him and the law that they were under, but others wouldn't. Um, others wouldn't have had the same knowledge and would have just assumed that Mary had been unfaithful or that Mary and Joseph had both committed adultery. Society would have seen Mary as being unfaithful to the law and unfaithful to her husband. And it's quite probable that Mary would have been anxious and scared at times of, of what was ahead. She was a human. But what, what we read in the actual record is extreme courage and calmness. She accepts the duty with praise and gladness. And there's this um, quote by a woman who wrote for um, CBE, Christians for Biblical Equality International. She said, Mary showed phenomenal courage in facing shame and potential abandonment for the sake of following God. She is unquestionably one of the heroes of faith and we miss something important when we ignore her remarkable courage and faithfulness to God. May we imitate her faith and her courage in obeying God's call. So after being told by Gabriel that Elizabeth was also pregnant, Mary went to meet her cousin, Elizabeth. And in verse 41 it reads, When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the child leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why has this happened to me, that the mother of my Lord comes to me? For as soon as I heard the sound of your greeting, the child in my womb leapt for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfilment of what was spoken to her by the Lord. That almost seems like a subtle dig at Zechariah for not believing. But the story is also really foreshadowing the relationship that John the Baptist would have with Jesus. Gabriel said to Zechariah that the child will be full of the Holy Spirit even before it was born. And the reaction to this, this all, all of the things happening was just complete joy all, all the way through. Elizabeth is obviously overwhelmed. And Mary um, eventually speaks a song which has been called the Magnificat because of how she says, my soul magnifies the Lord. Um, so in this song, Mary expresses firstly God's, um, some gratitude for God's favour towards her. And then she extends her, um, th her range of thought to all the faithful as well, for all those who worship God and, ha and how God reverses the misfortune and humbles the proud lifts up the lowly and sends away the rich empty, in verses 50 to 53. And then in the last two verses, 54 to 55, Mary then finishes by praising him for his faithfulness to his promises, including the promises of Abraham, which were mentioned before tonight. And this just underscores again what a momentous occasion this all was. After centuries of relative silence, and I'll say this again and again because it's something that we can probably relate to, with no king and with the uncertainty of Israel being thrown from one ruling nation to the next, there's finally the promise of a good king and a time when the world will see justice forever. And the IVP New Testament commentary makes this comment. Mary is exemplary of the humble, faithful disciple. That a woman provides such an example is significant since first century culture often relegated women to secondary status. Such examples exist in the Old Testament though as well. Miriam in Exodus 15 verse 21, Hannah, Deborah. One of the beauties of Luke's infancy material is that different sorts of people all experience joy at the arrival of Jesus. And this reveals Jesus' universal appeal. In particular, Mary's song seems to follow the themes of Hannah's song very closely in 1 Samuel 2 which is understandable given that they're in kind of similar situations. So after three months, Mary ends up leaving Elizabeth and John, but the story remains with the older couple as they give birth to John. So verses 57 to 66 essentially starts with all of Elizabeth's neighbours coming and celebrating the birth of John, and we're about to name him Zechariah. And while we don't see much of it in the Old Testament, this tendency to 
um, name people after their ancestors was common in, in the time of Elizabeth and Zechariah. But despite their preparations to call the baby Zechariah, both Elizabeth and Zechariah insisted that the baby was to be called John. And then when, John, when, when Zechariah accepted that, Zechariah wrote, um, after writing John's name on the table, he su was suddenly able to speak again. So just thinking about it, for all the neighbours already, this was a pretty strange evening. Not only were they old people giving birth, which they already knew, and, they, and not only were these old people strongly insisting on giving their son a pretty unconventional name for the time, now there was a sign which caused all the neighbours to wonder, when will this, what then will this child become? Zachariah's response to this question was another prophetic song of praise, which has been called Benedictus, which means blessed, um, when he said, blessed be the Lord. So in this song, first, the first few verses um, write about Zachariah's praise to God for raising up a mighty saviour to, to, to deliver Israel from her enemies, as it was prophesied from of old. Then in verses 72 to 25, to emphasize God's faithfulness again, that he has remembered his promises, meaning that the faithful can serve without fear. And then in the last four verses, Zechariah turns the subject to the baby, which has just been born, telling of his great duty to prepare Israel for Christ and heralding a new dawn, in, in John's own words, because he says in verses 78 to 79, by the tender mercy of our God, the dawn from on high will break upon us, to give light to those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death, to guard our feet in the way of peace. I've read that before. In terms of Luke's record, this is the last that we will read of Zachariah and Elizabeth. Um, we had read earlier, that in, in, earlier in Luke chapter 1, that they had prayed for deliverance and joy to come to Israel. But going by Zachariah's initial reaction, they probably didn't expect it to come to themselves. But here they are now, parents of a son who will herald the saviour in his own lifetime. And from Zechariah's song, it seems like they themselves, that they saw themselves as sitting in darkness and in the shadow of death. But finally they see the first light of that dawn, and we can understand why it's such a happy occasion for Zechariah and Elizabeth. And this is also the last that we'll read of John until he's, um, until he's full grown. But we, read, we just read for now in verse 80 that the child became strong and grew in the spirit and was in the wilderness until the day he appeared publicly to Israel. So now having covered the birth of John, Luke naturally moves on to the birth of Christ. Mary and Joseph, whom Luke only introduces now, have come to Bethlehem in order to register for the census. With the inn booked out, Mary ended up giving birth to Jesus in a shelter nearby. Now Luke could have just left it there, but for some reason shepherds play a significant role in this section. These were just shepherds who happened to be in the region and it was revealed to those shepherds by angels that the long-awaited Messiah was in a manger in Bethlehem and then they were treated to that song sung by the angels in heaven. Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth Peace to those whom he favours. Um, I, I found this all a pretty sweet moment because it's like the angels just couldn't keep it to themselves. So they appear to some shepherds and say, hey, the Messiah's finally been born, go check it out. Not to mention praising God right in front of them. So after the angels left in verse 15, the shepherds unsurprisingly go to check it out. And they did so with haste in verse 16. And when they found the child lying in the manger, they told them what had happened and finally returned. However, meanwhile, Luke records that Mary treasured all of those words and pondered them in her heart, something he would only have been able to find out from Mary herself. So a few minutes ago, I asked why Luke could have included this detail in the record at all. Um, I'm thinking maybe the reason is a simple as the reason why Mary shared it with Luke in the first place, that it was an exciting and joyful event and she treasured those words and pondered them in her heart. Maybe we could do the same. And also on that note, Zachariah, Elizabeth, John and Joseph and Simeon and Anna, all the characters which we will consider tonight, have passed away by the time of Jesus' ministry, um, let alone by 
let alone, so, so basically all those characters which we would have read of tonight would have passed away by the time Luke had written his gospel quite easily. Mary was probably the only person who Luke would have found out any of these details. And based on that, probably most of what we read in this section was given by Mary herself. All of these feelings of joy and praise and hopefulness are things that Mary had decided to treasure all this time, including some of the things that will happen in the next section after Jesus was circumcised in verse 21 and taken into the temple from verse 22 onwards. This section is Jesus cleansing at the temple and both Gospels present Jesus' parents as faithful, law-abiding Jews. So 40, time, 40 days after Jesus was born was the time that Mary's purification, mentioned in Leviticus 12, was over. And so they came at the same time to, with a sacrifice and also to present Jesus as holy to God. But all that is just setting the scene. When they come to the temple in verse 25, Luke introduces us to Simeon, whom Luke describes as righteous and devout, looking forward to the consolation of Israel. He also had it revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he wouldn't see death until he'd seen the Messiah. So it seems he's old by this point. And because when he finally finds Jesus and takes him into his arms, he sings another song. And this one is called um, by church tradition, Nunc Dimittis. And the song basically is this. Father, now you are dismissing your servant in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for the revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. So you can probably tell that the song starts joyfully and quickly. It escalates to an appreciation of the, of the salvation that God has for the whole world. And by including that song, Luke is foreshadowing his writings of both the Gospel and Acts which, and, and because both of those writings together emphasise the global reach of salvation through Christ. So this was apparently the first time that Mar Mary and Joseph actually considered how Jesus will bring salvation to the whole world. Because verse 33 says, and the child's father and mother were amazed at what was being said about him. But this is also where they'll, be find, where they'll find out about how hard, how hard Christ's mission will be because Simeon adds that the child is destined for the falling and the rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be opposed so that the inner thoughts of many will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. I'll come to this very soon. There was another elder in this temple, um, a prophetess named Anna. Luke tries to underline her faithfulness as a Jew as a, as a point of credibility because, as, as I mentioned at the very start, one of Luke's objectives were to provide some credibility to Christianity and its usefulness um, to the world as a whole. One commentary says that Luke actually devotes more time to emphasising Anna's reliability than to her reaction, to render unimpeachable her testimony concerning Jesus. And this is illustrated by a few points which I have just listed here. Firstly, she was a prophetess, which is obviously kind of important in establishing her spiritual credentials. Um, secondly, she retained her heritage. Um, the gospel record mentions that she was of the tribe of Asher. The third point is that her, her life of prayer and fasting at the temple is also a, a pretty obvious indicator. But there's also the fact that she is a widow. And this can seem strange to us, but the, one of the commentaries which I used writes that Jewish and Greco-Roman culture often viewed widows who never remarried as pious and faithful. Judith, a famous widow in Jewish tradition, was said to have lived as a widow until her death at 105. A few commentaries have also mentioned that Anna was probably about the same age, assuming that she was married at a common age of 14, um, plus the years which she was married and then the years which she was a widow add up to about 105. Um, but the exact age is probably a coincidence, given that Luke doesn't comment on it at all. But despite the speculation, that, that speculation, in those times people did respect age much more than they do today, um, because pro probably due to the maturity and wisdom that came with age. Um, but as with the shepherds, 
who Luke doesn't actually say anything that they, they said. Luke doesn't relay what Anna actually said. Um, he only says in verse 38 that this 105-year-old woman began to praise God and speak about the child to all who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. And then in verse 39 to 40, he finishes up. He returns to Galilee. Um, Mary and Joseph return to Galilee, and the child grew. This is where this whole kind of string of stories end because the next thing that Luke writes is something that actually happens 12 years later Um, and this story provided by Luke is a unique story that we only find in his gospel Um, and this Bible background commentary introduces the story to help us understand it a bit better to understand it a bit better and I'm just going to read it out now where possible ancient biographers would tell significant anecdotes about their subjects youth sometimes about spectacular child prodigies, e.g. Joseph, um, Josephus and Cyrus. And in chapter 2, verse 20 to 40, Jesus intrigued prophets, and in verse 41 to 52, he intrigues the teachers of the law. So Mary, Joseph and Jesus, like all Jewish families, went to Jerusalem every year for the Passover. But this, on this occasion, they lost their son. Mary and Joseph found Jesus eventually, right in the temple, sitting amongst the teachers and interacting with them, amazing them with all of his understanding and answers. And Mary asks, Child, why have you treated us like this? Look, your father and I have been searching for you in great anxiety. If you ever use that line on your kids when you lose them in a busy place, your kids probably won't respond like Jesus did. Why are you searching for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? That's a pretty weird answer, so it's understandable that in verse 50, Mary and Joseph didn't really get him. But he went back to them, to Nazareth anyway, as verse 51 says, and he was obedient to them both. So just thinking about Mary again, right from the announcement of Jesus' birth, Mary had a challenge ahead of her. Not only would she have borne the shame in her society of being regarded as a mother who got pregnant before she was married, Um, There was also the fact that she was raising a child that she knew had a great responsibility and also a painful ministry ahead. And Joseph died at some time between between that occasion and between Jesus' ministry because he never read of him again. And that obedience and respect that Jesus had for his mother would have continued when Jesus helped his widowed mother raise all his brothers and sisters. So Luke finishes the story again with an insight from Mary in verse 51. He says, His mother treasured all these things in her heart, and Jesus increased in wisdom and in years, and in divine and human favour. So tonight we went through the story of Christ's birth and infancy in Luke verse, uh, chapters 1 to 2, focusing mainly on the story and characters themselves, and how the coming birth of Christ all impacted them. Ever since the monarchy and faith system was shattered by the exile, Israel had never had never been the same. And for centuries, they just they were just tossed to and fro by stronger nations. All the while, over those centuries, they eventually developed some stronger and more defined expectations for a Messiah. And so, when there were suddenly angels appearing and singing to shepherds and announcing miraculous births including of the long-awaited Messiah, we can hopefully understand why joy and hopefulness fill these chapters so strongly. And I thought I'd close with some audience participation. Um, Usually you wouldn't trust a weird creep who hands out sweets, but I've taken five chocolates from Angie's marvellous fundraising chocolate box, and I'm hoping for for that reason that... I could get some of you to share, at least five, what the birth of Christ means for you.